So um, now, uh, <coughs> I want to use this rule to analyze this situation, OK? So let's just rescue this electric field because I want to keep it. Okay. So I want to calculate. So this is the question I want to answer. What force um, does the I <coughs> exert on the atom? So what force does the iron exert on the atom? Actually, this force is equal to it is equal to the force exerted by the atom on the iron. So the force that the iron exerts on the atom is equal but opposite to the force that the atom exerts on the iron. Everyone happy with that? So I'm using Newton 3. They'll have opposite directions, but the same magnitude. Okay. What is the force exerted by the atom uh, on the iron? Well, <coughs> this force F, let's work out its magnitude, will be the magnitude of the electric field set up by the atom times by the charge of the atom. That will be the force of the atom fields. It's just the charge of the atom times the electric field that the atom fields. Is everyone happy with that? But what is this electric field? Ah, so let's take a look. I want to know what force does the iron feel? Okay, so uh, the iron will feel a force by the electric field set up by the atom. Happy with that? Yes, therefore, it should be the charge of the iron. What do you want to the electric field set up by the atom? The force exerted by the atom on the iron. Yes. Be the charge of the ion times electric field set up by the atom, not this electric field of the atom. Your subscript for the charge oh. should be iron. Okay, good. So, so, so let me change. Okay, let me change this um, notation a little bit. I see that I'm mixing up a few things. What force does the iron exert on the atom? That's fine. Equals first exerted by the atom on the iron. Good. Thank you. Yeah. I was interested in the reverse, the reverse of the electric field by ion times the charge of the atom. Okay, that's the first question. Okay, but these I'm using Newton's third law to write this. Right. Okay, happy with that? Good. Now, the electric field set up by the atom is an electric field set up by a dipole, and we know the field set up by a dipole. There it is. Okay, so I'm going to use this now. So this will be equal to. 2 over 4 pi epsilon naught x squared. I will have the charge of the ion and I will multiply by the magnitude of P. Sorry? X cubed. Cubed. Good. Thank you. Yep. Now, is the mod of P a constant? Yeah. 
Is it a constant? Yes. yes. How do we get the mod of P? The mod of P is equal to some constant times by the mod of the electric field. And what electric field is this? This is the electric field that is polarizing the atom, right? So that's the electric field set up by the ion. Does that depend on the distance between the two? Yes. If I move this atom further and further away from the ion, what happens to the electric field? Gets smaller and smaller. So what happens to the electric dipole moment? Gets smaller and smaller. Is the electric dipole moment a constant? No. It also depends on position. And now it will be alpha. So we'll have two charge of the ion over four pi epsilon naught x cubed times by alpha times by and now I need the electric field set up by the ion. What's the electric field set up by the ion? Charge of the ion over four pi epsilon naught x squared. That's how the field falls off for a point charge. Good. So now let's collect all of the factors together and let's explore this answer a little bit. So this looks like 2 alpha over 4 pi epsilon naught. Let's have that squared. We will have x to the 5 and we will have q i n squared. So how does the field fall off now? Like 1 over x to the 5. Can somebody explain to me why 1 over x to the 5? Why is it 1 over x to the 5? Can you just summarize maybe how we got that? Does the ion and the atom also form a kind of dipole? No. How does the field of the dipole fall off? 1 over x cubed times by dipole moment. How does the dipole moment depend on x? 1 over x squared because that's the field of the ion. So it's the 1 over x squared fall off of the field of the ion and the 1 over x cubed fall off of the dipole. And those two are conspiring to give you a 1 over x to the 5 fall off of this induced force between the two. That 1 over x to the 5 is very typical for induced forces. What does it mean? It means the force falls off very, very quickly at long distances, but it picks up very rapidly at short distances. When you rub the piece of pen and you try to pick up that piece of paper, you may have noticed that as you bring the, paper, the pen towards the paper, towards the paper, towards the paper, the paper just sits there and then all of a sudden it just jumps up, very suddenly. The reason for that is you're probing 1 over x to the 5 at small x and that changes very rapidly. So as you just move closer to the paper, all of a sudden it jumps up to the pen. That's what you're seeing with the 1 over x to the 5. Then there's something else. This doesn't depend on Q, it depends on Q squared. If you see a dependence on Q squared, what, what do you think that that means? The physical effect that you're talking about doesn't depend on whether the charge is positive or negative. That's what it means. Now let's see if that's really true. Let's say that we have a positive charge here and here's our atom. How will our atom polarize? This side of the atom will be negative and this side positive. Is the force attractive or repulsive? Attractive. Why? Because the force between this negatively charged side and the positive charge is greater than the force between this positive and that positive. Why is the force between the negative and the positive greater? Because that distance is smaller. And the force falls off like 1 over distance squared. Happy with that? So here we have an attractive force. 
Now let's consider the case that we have a negative ion interacting with an atom. If this is a negative ion, what side will this be? Positive, Positive because now the electron cloud is repelled. If the electron cloud is repelled, this side of the atom will become negative and this side will become positive. Is this attractive or repulsive? Attractive. Why? Because the force between the negative and the positive will be greater than the force between the negative and the negative. That's what you're being told when you see Q squared in your formula. Attractive here and attractive there. The physics doesn't depend on whether Q is positive or negative. Okay? And the 1 over x to the 5 is because 1 over x cubed for the dipole, 1 over x squared for the iron. Are we happy with that, guys? Yep? Uh, what happens if we consider a case where we have an atom in the and a negative and a negative and a negative? What happens to the electron cloud? Ah, so, so you mean we put an atom exactly in the middle and two negatives on either side? Yes. Okay, then what will happen is you'll be able to add up the electric fields, okay? And at the location of the atom, the electric fields will tend to cancel. So you'll get a very small effect. The cancellation will not be perfect because the, the electric fields will not quite cancel perfectly. And what you'll find is you'll induce something else. It won't be a dipole, it'll be something else, probably a quadrupole or some, some higher moment. And um, anyway, that would take a lot more work. Okay? Yeah. Any other questions? Yes? So, Marcus? If you have a, a dipole that's induced by the electron cloud moving a fraction of the radius width. Yep. But your electron is moving much more than that all the time. Wouldn't that induce a dipole all by itself? Okay, good. So w what we will see soon, okay, we're going to do a calculation when we talk about permanent magnets, where we're going to study this electron whizzing around the nucleus. Can anyone tell me roughly how fast an electron goes? compared to the speed of light. What do you think? Same speed? Okay, so it won't go at the speed of light. Closer to the speed of light, slower. Okay, obviously slower. Okay, does anyone say faster? Good. Yeah, is it walking speed? Maybe electrons go at one meter per second? Two meters per second? Okay. Electrons move at about 1% of the speed of light. So that electron is whizzing around there. So there will indeed be this crazy time-dependent electric field produced by this electron whizzing around the atom. The point, however, is we don't see that field. We react so slowly that we'll see an average field. And because it's an average field that we see, even though the electron is moving much more than the shift of the cloud, it's the shift that's important for determining what the average electric field is. Okay? So that's why the shift plays a role. Good so question. As, as long as the ion is, is quite heavy, but if you have something light, then something that can react on the same time scales as your electron. Okay, so, so whatever you've got that is producing the field at this point, our source is always assumed to be robust. So we're not considering back reaction. When you start to consider back reaction, when your source can also react, then you can have more interesting effects occurring. In classical electromagnetism, though, you never have to worry about the fact that the electron is whizzing around. You know, it took people a lot of work to figure out that there were electrons. It's not something that's easy to detect. And it's not easy to detect that there's a charge floating around there. You really have to start asking questions where you probe very short scales and you're using light probes. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, then there's just one thing left for today's lecture. The joke. The joke. Okay. Now, this one actually involves a bit of history. And um, the history that involves is at the time of the French Revolution. So at the time of the French Revolution, the French Revolution happens. And at this stage, the French people are really sick of having revolutions. So they decide no more revolution. And they pass a law. If you are caught making revolution, you will be sentenced to death. And there's two versions of the law. 
if you're a bad criminal, but not too bad, they put you on the guillotine and you face down. Then they pull the blade and the guillotine comes, shoo, cuts your head off. If you're a really bad guy, they put you on the guillotine facing up and you have to watch the blade come down. So that's the worst. So three guys are actually making revolution and they get caught. I'm telling you guys this is true, you might not believe me. One of them was a mathematician. <laughs> one of them was a physicist. And one of them was an engineer. So anyway, they are found guilty and of the worst kind of treason. So they have to sit there facing up. They only have one hope now. If they pull the guillotine blade and it gets stuck, and then they reset it, they pull the guillotine blade and it gets stuck, at that point, they say, no, God is telling us that this person is innocent and he can go free. The blade has to get stuck twice. So anyway, they're sitting there, they've got the guillotine set up, all of the people are around to watch this, and they say, go fetch the mathematician. So they go fetch the mathematician, the mathematician walks out bravely, he's not scared. <laughs> they take him, they strap him down to the guillotine, they pull the blade, the blade starts to fall and it gets stuck. So they pull the blade back up again, they unstrap the mathematician, they take him back. The mathematician is not phased, he walks back bravely to his quarters. The guy in charge of the guillotine calls the engineers who built it and he says to them, look guys, figure out what the problem is. So they oil the machine, they check it carefully, they get a watermelon, they put it there, they pull the handle, the blade comes down. The watermelon's cut in two, he says, bring the mathematician. <laughs> so they go and they fetch the mathematician, the mathematician walks out bravely. They strap him down to the machine, they pull the handle, the blade starts to fall, it gets done. Then they unstrap the mathematician and say to him, look man, we're sorry, you were actually innocent, you're free to go. And the mathematician walks off bravely into the ground. Then they say, Guys, this guillotine is not getting the job done. Please fix it. So these guys redesign it, they oil it, they make sure it's working. They put in the watermelon, they test it, and they say, bring the engineer. So the engineer comes along, the engineer is crying and whimpering, it's only an engineer cat. They bring him in, they strap him down, they pull the handle, the blade starts to fall and it gets stuck. So they unstrap him, they take him back, and the engineer's shocked, and they put him back in the cell. And they say, please guys, redesign the machine, make sure that it's working. So they redesign the whole guillotine, they test it, now they're convinced it will work. They go, they fetch the engineer, they put him down again. Pull the blade, the blade gets stuck. They say to the engineer, look, we're sorry man, you were actually innocent, off you go, you're free. And the engineer walks off, you know, crying, <laughs> totally shocked by the experience. Then they go, they check the machine again, they oil it, they grease it, they test it, they redesign it, they get the physicist. They bring the physicist, they strap him down, they pull the handle, the blade starts to fall, it gets stuck. They start to unstrap the physicist and the physicist says, hang on guys, give me a moment, I know how to fix this thing. <laughs> okay guys, that's it for today, see you tomorrow.